I was always somebody who had a plan. When I was 12 years old, I took my first trip to New York City, and I saw my first Broadway show, and when the lights were coming up on Bernadette Peters, I knew exactly what my, my life's plan was gonna be. I wanted to work on Broadway. And at age 12, I saw absolutely no reason why that couldn't happen. And so I was thrilled when, as I uh, was about to finish university, I had already received my first professional job. I was chosen to play Quasimodo in Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame. Let's see, there's, there I am in all my glory. Uh, <laughs> I was thrilled, I've always been a big Disney fan and I was so excited, but of course my younger brother told me I got the part because I didn't need any costume or makeup. <laughs> but after years of therapy, I'm good to go. <laughs> I was really excited. I, I literally took my last final at university and drove across the country and began rehearsals there in Orlando for that first job and I was so excited. Did that for about a year, then I moved to New York and I decided I had to get on with my plan of working on Broadway and it probably took me about 24 hours of being in New York before I realized exactly how many other people had the very same dream that I had at age 12. I could not believe how many actors there were that looked like me, that talked like me, that danced better than me, that sang better than me. It was pretty overwhelming. And after about a year of being in New York and with no sign of my little plan coming together, I was really down about it. And about that time, I came across a study that I found very interesting. If you don't know this about fleas, fleas have this amazing capacity to jump. They can jump like across the room, which I find pretty disgusting. Uh, but I read this study about fleas. These scientists took a group of fleas and they put them inside of a jar. And uh, with, those, the, with them in the jar, they put the lid on the jar. And knowing what we now know about fleas, what do you think happened? Yes, of course, they began jumping and hitting their heads on the lid of the jar, right? And the scientists let about a week go by. And during that week, the fleas learned to adjust the height of their jump. And they began just jumping just under the height of the lid of that jar, that limitation. Smart fleas, right? That way they wouldn't knock their brains out as they were jumping. Um, and then the scientists let one more week go by, and what they noticed is that the fleas continued jumping at the very same height. They continued just jumping over where they believed the limitation of the lid was. Even though they could have jumped out to their freedom, they continued jumping just that high. And I realized when I read that study that that was me. That just like those fleas, I had adjusted. Here I was, I had this great dream of being on Broadway, and then as soon as I got to New York and heard, nope, we're looking for somebody taller, nope, we're looking for somebody with a deeper voice or whatever it is, I started to adjust, and I started to expect the no, that I was not gonna get that job. And I realized after reading that study that if I, can, if I didn't start changing my way of thinking, that I was gonna be stuck in that jar just like those fleas were, and I was never gonna jump out to my freedom. And so I began to adjust my thinking to what I now call open jar thinking, which is to say, no matter what you want in life, no matter what it is you're after, you jump with all of your might, and you get it. And one day that lid might just be open. You might be auditioning for the role of your lifetime, or you might be interviewing for the, for the job of your lifetime. But if you're not putting 100% in it, you're definitely not gonna get it. And it was with this open jar thinking in mind that I began in New York uh, a program called the Open Jar Institute. It's an actor's theater training program. We bring in hundreds of students every year. We do classes in acting and singing and dancing, and, and these students work elbow to elbow with Broadway professionals. But we focus on audition techniques surrounded by this open jar thinking, which is to say every time you enter the room, every time you come in for an audition, you assume you are gonna get the job. And because now as I sit on the other side of the table and I'm lucky enough to work as a director and as a choreographer and I've been so lucky to work on lots of Broadway shows, my dream came true, uh, I notice that the people who come in to audition those that come through the door thinking, yes, I will get this job, those are the people that I'm drawn to when I'm casting a show. The people that come through the door with a maybe on their mind or I hope I'm good enough, they're not generally the person that I turn to, but the person that comes through the door knowing they're good enough to get the job, that's the person I tend to trust and I wanna put the weight of the show on their shoulders. And so that's, it's with that in mind that we teach at the Open Jar Institute. 
And I believe it's an important uh, lesson for all of us um, throughout life, really, to approach life in that way. Uh, now, you can't get every single job. There's, not that, there's just way too many actors to give every single job. But I believe if you do approach it with that way, you might not get that job, but you may get the next job. Uh, not long after I, as an actor, decided to shift my thinking to open jar thinking, I auditioned for a show called The Scarlet Pimpernel. You know it, yes. <laughs> It's a great show. I was in the final callbacks for one of the leading roles, and I was told the next day was going to be the final callback. So the night before the final callback, I decided to go to the stage door. And so I, I went, oh, is it there, there already? Oh, good. I went, I went to the stage door. I knew where the theater was, and this is actually a picture of that door. And I stood across the street looking at the stage door, just hoping, just wishing sort of willing myself to work in this theater. And I had this incredible feeling come over me, and I just knew I was going to get this job. And talk about open jar thinking. I went to the audition knowing I was going to get the job, and I nailed the audition. And guess what? I did not get the job. <laughs> and I was confused. I actually took that really hard, because here I had sort of had this confirmation that I was going to get this job. I just knew that that was right. But fast forward five years from that date, I had just been hired to work on the national tour of Hairspray. And a couple of weeks before we began rehearsals for the national tour, the director of the tour said to me, hey, meet me at the stage door. I'll walk you in. We'll watch the Broadway production together. And as I walked up to the stage door, I realized it was the very same stage door I had been looking at before at the Neil Simon Theater. And I realized, oh, it's not going to be Darlene Scarlet Pimpernel. It's going to be five years later when I finally got to work in that theater. Uh, and since that time, I opened another show called Big Fish in that very same theater a couple of years ago. And it just so happens, as fate would have it, the archway where I was standing is actually now the entrance to my office in New York. And every day I walk through those doors right there, and I remember being that kid on those steps just wishing, just hoping that my dream would come true. Because I believe somehow inside, each one of us knows what it is that we're meant to do, what we're destined for, if we just allow ourselves the ability to trust ourselves, to allow ourselves to go beyond what we think our limitations are. And sometimes the limitations are real. And sometimes they're forced upon us by other people. But no matter what, we have to give ourselves the power to push beyond those limitations. While I was still waiting for my big break in New York, one of my first jobs in the city was to teach theater after school up in Harlem. So every Thursday, I would go up to Harlem, and I would teach theater exercises to these kids. And on day one of, the, of, of our classes, the administrator told me there's this six-year-old girl. She doesn't speak but she likes to participate, so you know, feel free to include her, but don't call on her and expect her to say anything because she doesn't speak, so of course I didn't. And one day I decided to do an exercise uh, where you pretend you're a seed and you plant yourself in the ground, and so we were all scrunched up like seeds, and then you start to sprout, and then soon you come, become a big tree sort of swaying in the breeze. And here we are swaying in the breeze, and this girl who never spoke began jabbering away and talking. And all the other students were like, Jeff, Jeff, she's talking, she's talking. I said, I know, just keep being the tree. <laughs> and from that day forward, that girl spoke. Whatever it was in that exercise gave this girl permission to jump out of her jar. Whatever her limitation was, I don't know if it was physical or emotional or mental or whatever it was, but suddenly being a tree allowed her to jump past <laughs> that limitation. It's an important lesson for all of us, really. And I was faced with this, and I had to remember this lesson myself a couple of years ago. I had this idea to create a software program. What do I know about software? I'm a musical theater guy. But being in musical theater, part of my job is to document. There's, uh, every Broadway show has what's called a show Bible. And a show Bible is a gigantic document, sometimes three, 4,000 pages long, of the detail of every bit of the show, from the choreography, detailing what foot you step on on count one, and is it turned in, is it turned out, uh, where are the actors standing? Every single detail you could possibly want to know has to be in this show Bible. And there was no software to create these show Bibles. I couldn't believe it. And so I had this idea I wanted to create this as a software piece, but what did I know? I didn't know anything about business. I know nothing about math. I only go up to eight, five, six, seven, eight, one. <laughs> so 
I didn't think I was the right guy to create a piece of software. And in fact, I hired a couple of experts to you know, look into it. Was this going to be a viable business? Because I knew it was a good idea, but was it viable uh, to, to do? And these experts came back to me saying, no, it's not. <laughs> and I just, I just knew somehow I had to do this. So I did. Four years later, four years ago, I, sh I should say, I, s I opened a company called Stage Right Software, which is now known as the, uh, the resource on documenting uh, choreography and staging. Nearly every Broadway show is using it. Huge entertainment companies from around the world. There are now courses at university being taught in Stage Right Software. And in fact, Apple themselves contacted me saying, we've been getting messages of people that wanted to buy an iPad just so they could work on this software. What's this about? And so I'm so glad that I did not listen to those experts who told me it was not a viable business. I think inside of us, we all know what it is that we're meant to do if we just allow ourselves that ability to work past whatever it is. Sometimes the, the limitations are real, and sometimes they're physical, sometimes they're not physical. Uh, but we, ha we have to allow ourselves the ability to work past them, certainly. A couple of years ago, uh, I had a student attend my summer institute at Open Jar Institute. And on day one, this kid was painfully shy. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine he was going to even survive the week. Uh, but at the end of the week, I was really amazed. He, this kid had totally transformed. He was boisterous, and everybody was his friend. And I thought it was a pretty amazing uh, transformation. And anyways, I said goodbye to the kid on the last day. Not, no sooner had I said goodbye to him, I got a tap on my shoulder. It was his mother. I thought, oh dear, what have I done? <laughs> and uh, she said, no, I want to thank you. This week has been incredibly transformative in his life. And I said, I know, it's amazing. What a transformation. She said, no, you have no idea. She said, this is a kid who was born with cerebral palsy. He never spoke. He couldn't talk. He couldn't walk. She said, until he was 11 years old, I basically carried him around like a bag of bones. And she said, I knew he liked music, so I took him to go see the Broadway production of Mary Poppins. And she said, sometime during that musical, he woke up. And he began singing the music of Mary Poppins. And then he learned to talk. And he started learning to walk. And now this kid is singing and dancing. And I just think he's a shy kid. But he's overcome so many obstacles. He's now going to theater school studying musical theater. And I have no doubt one day we'll be on Broadway. There's something incredibly powerful in the theater. I don't know what it is, whether it's just the act of sitting in a dark theater and watching the people on stage fighting for whatever it is that we want in life. Maybe it's that that gives us the inspiration that we need in our own lives to inspire us to attack our own demons, our own limits, the lids on our jars, but it's an important thing. I had the same experience in my life. I told you earlier when I played Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I was terrified. It was my first job out of school. And here I was, brand new actor, surrounded by professionals, and I just wanted to do a good job. And three weeks of rehearsal, I was pretty beaten down and just terrified. And on opening day of the show, here was my test. And if you ever saw the show down in Orlando, there was a runway that ran right down the middle of the audience. And on either side, there was audience members. And about here, on fifth row, around over here, there was a little boy, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And a couple times during the show, it was staged that I would be down there. And whenever I was near him, this kid would yell out, it's OK, Quasi, we love you, and just, which <laughs> I loved. I needed the inspiration, and I was so grateful for it. Anyways, I got to the end of the show and hadn't made any major mistakes. And I wanted to just go back and celebrate what a great job I had done. But luckily, this kid had other plans for me. So as I, in the curtain call, it was staged that one last time I would run down the aisle and just you know, wave to everybody. And as I come going down the aisle, this little kid stands up. And he lifts up his hand for me to give him a high five. And the hand he had lifted up was severely deformed. And so I went to go give him a high five. And as I did, he grabbed onto me with his other hand. And he pulls me down until we're face to face. And he says, we did it, Quasimodo. I'll never forget you. <laughs> And I made a promise to myself right then and right there that I would never again step on stage without remembering what it's really about. It's not about what a great actor I was. It's about telling stories who need 
to people who need to hear it. And it's not that often you get to be grabbed by the person in the audience who needs to hear your story the most, but they're out there. They're out there in every single audience. And it's not just actors. Yes, for actors, those people are in the audience. But if you're a mother, it's your children. If you're a teacher, it's your students. If you're a student, it's the people in your study group. We are all surrounded by people who need to be inspired to go beyond their limitations. I firmly believe that if one of those fleas in that jar had just decided to jump and disappear, the other ones would have realized something's wrong here. Maybe I can jump out. I believe that's our responsibility in life, to find the courage ourselves and to jump out of our jar, to go beyond our limitations into uncharted territory and to take others with us. And I believe that is an idea worth sharing. Thank you. Thank you.